Okay. Welcome back. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit uh, and, and sort of tie up uh, the period up to the revolution. And can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. I wanted to tie up to uh, the um, period before the revolution uh, and then review some things about the exam, talk a little bit about uh, I've, I, I've just posted a rubric on ELC, and I'll uh, walk you through that a little bit, and then I'll briefly uh, talk through a, a really good answer for one of the questions uh, in one of another one of my classes, so that you can kind of get a sense of what I'm what we're looking for. Uh, all right, but let's start, and this is a very brief lecture about the country store, and I think it captures the difference between or one of the key differences between me, 822750, the, the key differences between me and Watson. Uh, and I think you'll see this theme throughout Watson's book. And uh, I, I, there's an anonymous, uh, there's, so there's a comment here, will you post the prompt separately? There'll be, uh, uh, or will we have to start the exam to see the prompt? You'll start the exam, let's see. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure how you see it, um, but what I'll do is, uh, I'll, at the beginning of class on Friday, I'll sh use a PowerPoint just with those questions, um, what, the, what, the, what the questions are, um, and uh, either on Twitch or in person you can uh, ask, ask questions about them, um, and then you've got 24 hours to do uh, the exam itself, but it'll also, it should be when you go to the exam on ELC, you should also see those questions before you actually start it. Uh, very briefly, just for five minutes where I go, uh, you know, you're not required to come, I won't take attendance, but this is in case you have questions about the exam, in case you have questions about one of the questions, I'll, I'll be here for that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, how long do we have to take the exam? The exam is due 24 hours after, so, so at 10.20 on Saturday. And um, I ask that you take an hour to do the exam unless you have a DRC um, uh, uh, exemption or something like that. And if you have a DRC that says you get time and a half, then you can take an hour and a half. If you've got a DRC that says you can take two hours, you can take two hours. But in general, uh, you're on your honor, really, to take about an hour to do uh, the exam. If that makes sense. All right, the country store. Uh, my sense is that as much as um, Watson thinks about the, uh, yes, there is still pack back due on Friday. Um, you're not required to start the exam during class time. No, you can start it uh, at any time between uh, it's 10:20 on Friday and 10:20 uh, on Saturday. Uh, it will. Ha it does have a deadline, though a hard deadline of 10:20. So uh, make sure you you get it submitted uh, before that time because you won't be able to submit it after that. Okay. So Watson uses the phrase semi-subsistence, and I think this is important. Um, in, in the whole context of his whole argument, and, and, and this is why history is different from some of the other disciplines, because we're used to making an argument using evidence, um, and you can have multiple positions on, a, on, a, on, a, uh, on an issue. And I think the central argument or thread, which I, I kind of half believe, I suppose, um, in Watson, is that farmers have a semi-subsistence lifestyle. They are basically feeding themselves. They're practicing safety first. That is, they're producing enough food for themselves. And if they have a little extra land or a little extra time, they'll grow cotton or um, corn or wheat. And to me, this is, uh, and it's important for his argument because he wants to show that there is what he calls a um, 
market revolution that takes place in the 1820s. And this market revolution messes up the lives of many farmers because they're trapped in the market. They're angry, they push back, and they vote for someone like Andrew Jackson. So this is very, very key to his understanding of the rise of Jackson, the rise of democracy in the United States. And I think it's an interesting story and there's some truth to it, but I think uh, he actually misses how fundamentally these American farmers and planters on the edge of the Atlantic depend on this Atlantic world. Absolutely. Every day. Every minute of every day. And this idea that they are somehow subsistence farmers is, I think, ridiculous. You know, They're not wearing... Uh, <laughs> skins uh, from the animals that they've caught. <laughs> you know, they're not, uh, they're buying thread that comes from Britain. They're using needles that come from Britain. They're using corks that come from Spain. They're, 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 all of the things that they're using to farm are goods that are coming from elsewhere. And the, the semi-subsistence idea is, is a really problematic one, I think. Oh, sorry, there's another question here. We have only an hour to take the exam once we open it. No, um, once, you open, no once you open it, I, I, I'm not going to pay attention to when you open it. You can open this exam at, on Friday at 1020 and then go about your business for three or four or five hours or six hours thinking about it, noodling about it, whatever, and then sit down to write it at 9 p.m or something like that. I don't care when you write it. I ask you to stick to about an hour to, uh, so that's kind of fair. It's on, the, on, on, it's on your honor, right. We're not, we're not surveilling that. It's on the we're not surveilling uh, this to make sure that you're sticking to one hour. I just ask that you stick to one hour. Um, uh, you know, so we're not expecting uh, something to be absolutely perfectly polished as if you took all day to write it. Uh, this is, this is an, uh, an answer to an exam question. Okay, I hope that's clear. So, what's what's the? Why do I think that there's no semi-subsistence? Why do I think that um, farmers didn't really kind of? Whoa. spitting in your, your guys' direction. It's, it's like perfect, it's, it's like below my neck. Like, what the hell are they thinking? I'm not that tall. All right, I'm going to start streaming again. Bear with me. This is a day. Okay. Oh, okay. We are streaming again. All right. Apologies for those of you on Twitch. We didn't die. There wasn't a nuclear holocaust. Um, I found my glasses. All is good. Okay, so a question. The farmers depended on what, in your opinion, the Atlantic? 
uh, know that a farmer's depended on their country store. The country store is the thing that made, that was the connection between farmers and the world. It was the thing that provided all of the goods that you needed uh, to survive on a farm in the 18th century. Yes, uh, your last statement was when you were about to talk about why farmers were not semi-subsistence. What they depended on was this guy. The person here in the center of this picture is not actually a planter. It's a storekeeper. And the storekeeper, who is sitting next to a barrel of provisions that he makes available, and another barrel that's got tobacco, um, is... The person, this is a Scottish merchant from Scotland. He's sent from Scotland to the United States, uh, well, to the American colonies. He then lends money to farmers. He does this indirectly. He lends them he, because, because he comes over having brought with him steel plows and corks and needle and thread and fabrics from elsewhere, well, comes over with spices, and all these things he advances to the farmer after he looks at his uh, land. He'll walk around, he'll see how much land the farmer has, uh, see if he's a respectable person, and if so, will lend him all the goods that he needs for an entire year until the harvest. And at harvest time, he'll charge him with the goods that he produces, right? the flour that he produces, or the tobacco, or the cotton, or the corn that is produced. This is not true on the big plantations, but it's true of most farmers um, in this region, is that they have a relationship with the country store, and the country store provides those goods to them so that they can keep the farm running. A farmer without a country store, <laughs> is, it just doesn't exist. There isn't such a thing. And this is easy to forget. I think uh, part of it, and, and I, I would, part of it is this sort of utopian idea. I think that some historians have that farm life was just out in the country, and you had nothing, and you just uh, stood for yourself. Having grown up on a farm for part of my life, um, obviously the 20, 20th century farm, um, it, farm life is all about. I'm missing this. I need to go <laughs> pick it up. Um, and it's all about credit, and it's all about how much you can grow, and the dependence on uh, a town nearby for the pr uh, pr provisions is absolutely undeniable. And, it's, and if you look at the record books of farmers in the 17th century, it's the same thing. Um, at least once a week, you would go back to the store to get things that you needed. There's a credit chain that makes it possible for farmers to farm, British uh, or British colonists to farm. Now, of course, they may be German or they may be French. They may be. Um, they're not necessarily British, but they're part of the British Empire. And as part of the British Empire, you've got people like this. First of all, the first person in the chain is the Atlantic merchant, who buys British and other goods on a yearly cycle. He sells wood, flour, and rum to the Caribbean. So this is what the American colonists are providing, wood, flour, and rum. He will probably operate a flour mill in Baltimore or uh, Richmond or something like that, Wilmington, Delaware. He'll take farmers' wheat, turn it into flour, pack it into barrels, and sell it in the Caribbean. And he operates mostly with his own money. He's very likely to be have a family member, a brother or an uncle, who lives in Britain, who is providing him part of the family fortune to make this enterprise possible. And the family is diversified, which is crucial for any merchant like this, who's worth, say, uh, 100 or 200 pounds, which is... Uh, quite rich by in today's dollars. Um, diversified, he'll have uh, English consuls, 
which provide a regular flow of payments for um, just necessary expenses. He'll have notes. He'll be able to borrow a line of credit of four or 500 pounds in London or in Liverpool so that he can buy the goods and bring them back. And he'll pay them back on a bill of exchange uh, of something like a year. So, so basically he's borrowing these goods to pay back in a year and he's doing and he's basically providing provisions. That's the Atlantic merchant. Oh, well, the question, what happens if the harvest did not do so well? Well, that's where you get in trouble. Um, but let me, let me just uh, bring the chain all the way down to the country store. The next person in the uh, chain, and so this is somebody like John Jacob, uh, sorry, this is somebody like John Jacob Astor, or uh, who else? Um, Junius Morgan, J.P. Morgan's father, or um, Simon Melville, Herman Melville's father. These are large merchants in New England. The next person in the link is the jobber, called the dry goods jobber. And he, he organizes these goods for shipment back to Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Western Pennsylvania. And the jobber uses his own capital to buy from merchants, the rich merchants like Melville, and then he lends these goods to Western country merchants. And the Western country merchant is somebody who lives out in, say, oh, uh, Albany, New York, which is kind of Western, uh, or Schenectady, New York, say, um, a little bit further in the back country. He comes, that the, the little, little merchant comes to meet jobbers in New York once a year. Um, the jobber provides him with enough goods to fill his country store and will even um, fill his wagon, which is going to take all these goods back to the store to provide them to farmers. He also uses his own capital to buy from these merchants. And he trusts that these country merchants are not just going to disappear with his goods, but they're going to come back. Uh, dry uh, goods merchants like this, jobbers like this, um, were competed with each other in the city of New York. Uh, these are the people who invented the mixed drink as, <laughs> uh, because in part they lure um, would-be uh, um, country store operators into their uh, dry goods store with uh, alcoholic drinks. And American alcoholic drinks were notoriously nasty tasting and so you needed to add sugar and lemon and all these other things to make them drinkable. Uh, the question, wasn't rum produced in the Caribbean? Oh, this is back to this. Um, yes, there was some rum produced in the Caribbean, but there was more rum produced in New England than in the Caribbean. So it's a, quite a large and complicated enterprise to take um, the uh, product of sugar and turn it into rum. Uh, and there's a great deal of rum manufactured in, um, in New England. Oh, okay. Is the Atlantic Merchant the first or second link? Is Country Store the first? Okay. I would say the Atlantic Merchant is the first link, the Jobber is the second link, and the Country Store Merchant is the third link. Each of these has a relationship to each other. Each of them is concerned about how the other is doing. Uh, each of them is likely to uh, make sure that their loans get paid, right? So. The Atlantic merchant is effectively lending goods to the jobber, who is effectively lending goods to the country store operator. This process of lending is extremely powerful, extremely important, and very different from what's happening in the French and the Spanish empires. It's part of the financial revolution. It's connected to the financial revolution. It's this long-term credit that makes it possible to um, expand rapidly into the West. And in the country store, you sell the goods to the farmers. The storekeeper writes their names and purchases down on a book, and the farmer settles up at the harvest. The farmer is borrowing for necessities. The price for these goods that are in the country store, uh, collars, horse collars and pitchers and cloth needles and plows, 
is bumped up quite a bit by that chain of credit, right? Each, buddy's, each person's charging about 10% on those goods that are finally arriving at the country store. The country merchant charges you interest for those goods if, you, um, if you're late in your payment. If your harvest fails, you're bankrupt, you go to jail. Okay. If the, if the merchant thinks that you're good for it, then he'll extend you credit at a 35% or more interest rate for the next year. And next year, you better have the harvest to pay last year's goods and this year's goods. Does that make sense? So this is banking, right? This is a kind of banking. It's a kind of delivery of goods, but it's also a kind of banking because there's a series of loans that are going back, all the way back to London, all the way back to this financial center that's new after 1688. And if we don't understand stores, we don't understand why British colonization works as well as it does. Because when the financial revolution hits in Britain, it's, it doesn't just allow Britain to tax and to put navies in the sea. It also creates a kind of financial infrastructure for merchants to engage in very long distance trade uh, in a way independent of the crown. They use the Bank of England they circulate these bills of exchange. There's all these lending documents. And it, it operates quite differently from Spain and France with our royal monopolies, where you get these goods from. Oh, can I repeat how the jobber benefits from giving to the country store? So the jobber benefits by, he, he knows all uh, the other Atlantic merchants. They're probably... Uh, eight or nine of them in uh, a decent sized city, port city like Philadelphia or Boston or New York. And he'll go around and see what's available. He'll let him know. I've spoken to my country store folks and they would really like wool. There's not enough wool. And um, there's a real shortage of needles. The Atlantic um, merchant will then order more needles and more ribbons and more other things and sell them on credit to the dry goods jobber. The dry goods jobber will then provide credit to the country store. If someone died <laughs> working in a country store, they would be replaced, and that set person who was replacing them was, would just sort of take over the business, would look at the balance sheet and continue to charge um, farmers and provide them the vital goods that they need uh, to continue farming. This explains that some of the uh, largest fortunes in the United States in this period are connected to merchants. Really, the wealthiest people in the United States until uh, 1870 or so are not manufacturers or capitalists. They are merchants. So John Jacob Astor has a string of stores up and down the coast and in the Canadian frontier. And he's acting kind of as a banker because he's, he's lending to merchants who lend to farmers and then collects at harvest time. Scottish merchants do the same in Virginia. It's usually Quaker merchants who do the same in Pennsylvania. This whole process, I think, is what makes uh, the kind of economy of 17th century British North America and 18th century British North America tick. And it's missing from Watson's book. Um, why it's missing is another question. Part of this is, uh, I think, my own understanding of, I'm, I'm more interested in finance, but I also worked in companies that distributed clothes all over um, Canada and the United States uh, as a network engineer. And so I have a kind of sense of why, how and why this is important. And I did logistics and planning for those large organizations. So I understood how they worked. and you see the same process uh, existing in the 18th and the 17th century. And it's not just a nice thing to know or an interesting thing to know <laughs> or a boring thing to know. It's how Britain defeats its rivals in the New World. All right. And that's the difference between me and Watson. We'll talk more about 
uh, the revolution and those other issues after that. Let me now show you the rubric for the exam. I'm going to keep Twitch running. Uh, I have posted all the, um, all the lectures on YouTube. The link is in ELC. The names of the lectures, sometimes, uh, I look, some people have been looking at different ones. They, the, all the names for the classes in this, this semester start with an M. So MA is the first one, MB is the second one, MC is the third one. Does that make sense? There's others that start one, two, three, four, five. They look similar, but those are from 2000, 2021. The lectures are similar, but it's a different book I'm arguing against. <laughs> so, so it will be a little confusing if you look at the 2021 lectures. Uh, it's a good look at the 2022 20, lectures, MA, MB, MC, MD, right? Just to review, if you're, if you're reviewing. All right, wow, flood of questions. Can I repeat how the jobber benefits from giving to, oh, I did that. So John Jacob <laughs> asked her, would be appalled if you called him a storekeeper, but he is a person who provides for storekeepers. So, so he, he's, he's literally like a kind of banker storekeeper. And the function of a banker who makes decisions about who to lend to, and the session of a storekeeper who makes decisions about who uh, to give credit to for, far, for farming implements are kind of the same. There's no, they're, they're, they're related, deeply related processes. The idea that, uh, yep. Yeah. I, I think he's trying to figure out where to put it in the Atlantic merchant dry goods. Oh, I see, more. I see, right. got it, got it. John Jacob Burchett uh, Astor is an Atlantic merchant um, but one who also um, has his own, he's, he's, he's also a jobber, so, so he's, he, he does have his own, there are Astor stores that are his. So that, that's a good question, right? So he's an Atlantic merchant, but he has uh, his own stores. The baking lets British defeat, the banking lets British defeat rivals by having money. It's not the banking that lets, it's not um, money that allows Britain to defeat its rivals. It's credit. It's complicated chains of credit, like I just described, that allow this rapid expansion in the West. Does that make sense? Credit is vital because it means that you can plant more. It means that you can, um, uh, you can grow goods faster because you have access to fertilizer. It means you can plow deeper because you have access to steel plows. Um, all of that is possible because of a complicated system of credit. And when we think about that credit, you need to rec recognize that each person is looking at the other person to determine if they're a good credit risk. And so that means there's, there's going to be a tendency to support people who look like and act like you. So this does benefit white people. It does benefit the Knickerbocker aristocracy, the people who are descended from the Mayflower. <laughs> Have you seen the show The Gilded Age? Uh, no, it's, uh, there's, there, it, it's, it's not only kind of about white men, it's about white men f who are not German, <laughs> who are not French. So th there's, a, there's a really powerful credit stream that goes to these people, but it's a particular kind of people that each person uh, believes is a good credit risk. So it's, uh, men are going to be, uh, 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 white men are going to have preferential access to this whole stream of credit, and it's vital, it's crucial. Oh, that's great question. How did they keep control of the credit chains, not getting so long and running off with goods? Um, that's what the um, what Dunn and uh, the Dunn reports are for. Uh, basically, merchants keep secret logs of people by name and whether they're good or bad risks, and um, and whether they're criminals. They also use the law against those people if they disappear just disappear with the goods, um, but. But yeah, you don't lend next year to somebody if they've obviously if they run off. Uh, but also, you're, you're going to chase those people. Um, and then what we call the Dun and Bradstreet reports now, their ancestors are these secret um, Atlantic merchants that had secret books that said this person is likely to have a lot of money and likely to be a good risk. They're A1. This person, you've heard the expression A1, right? It refers to people. An A1. Risk is somebody who has a lot of money, that's A, and always pays his debts, one. Somebody who has a lot of money and doesn't pay his debts is A4. 
<laughs> someone who um, doesn't have a lot of money but always pays his debts might be C1. Okay, so that's how you do it, is you try to kind of trace people. You have an intelligence network um, that makes it possible for this credit to work. Okay, to the exam now. I first want to show you the rubric. Yes. All right, rubric for exams. What's a text file here? All right, uh, the A answer, rich content, clear thesis with excellent detail and evidence. Well, you can read this. Careful organization. This is only 300 words, but you want an introduction and a conclusion. You want to say what you're going to say and then and then say it. It's not a paper. It's like a little paper. Um, varied sentence structure, precise diction and tone, um, master of grammar and mechanics, and then memorable ideas that leave the reader satisfied and eager to reread the answer. A B is substantial information, logical, varied sentence structure, pleasurable to read. C is competent but predictable, vague generalities. Um, some organization, DNF is uh, awkward or ambiguous sentences, frequent mechanical or grammatical errors. Um, making an argumentative case in 300 words sounds like uh, it is, uh, I can tell you, having worked in a bunch of large corporations, a bunch of Fortune 100 corporations, is the most important superpower you will get from UGA. The ability to write a persuasive memo that takes account of multiple positions and argues for your own is vital. This is what you'll be doing on a regular basis in any large organization, any NGO, any bank, is to take seriously two different uh, interpretations and explain why one is better than the other. Uh, an example of this is, uh, my first example of this is I was put in a company called Dialex, which um, was in charge of all the, owned most of the clothing stores in Canada, and they were distributing over a very long, vast network. And, and uh, I came in and originally as a temp, as a, as a um, I was hired, I was brought in by an accounting firm to fix, and, and accounting firms do accounting, but they also fix problems, and the company was in trouble. And so I had been brought in as the network guy to fix their network. And I did a few things. I, I first put better passwords on things, then I established a system for replacing uh, devices. I found devices that weren't, weren't working very well and replaced those. I um, established a kind of protocol for passwords and whatever, a, a bunch of things. Made sure that the, um, all the cash registers connected properly over this long and complicated network. And after about three weeks, the, uh, the system had gone from crashing every day to not crashing at all. And after three days, the vice president came in and said, uh, I've just noticed that we haven't had a crash in three days. What did you do? And I wrote a 300 word memo. I said, well, this was a network that was proposed to you, but it was the wrong network. Uh, it's not been used by any other corporations. This was, um, this was why it failed. Uh, they were using something called Microsoft Network, which was a predecessor to the Windows Network. It, it was terrible. Um, I explained what the technical failures were, and um, and I was done. I was gone for three days. Uh, it was like Easter or something. I came back on Tuesday. Uh, Monday was a holiday, and I saw my boss's boss carrying a box out of the building. The box was everything that she had in the building. She was fired, so my boss was fired, my boss's boss was fired, and my boss's boss's boss was fired because of that memo. Because it stated clearly what the problem was with the network. And it, what I didn't realize at the time <laughs> was that it contradicted what they had been saying about the state of the network. 
And so for the rest of the time that I was there, I reported to the uh, vice president of finance. Um, a memo is a really powerful thing. A carefully written memo is a really powerful thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's a superpower, really. And so what, what I want to do is have you work on that. There are two different explanations. There's Nelson's explanation and there's Watson's explanation. In, in as clear a way as you can, in 300 words, describe which one you think is right. Does a test response need citations, references, and a specific format? Uh, that's a great question. You, d you do want, um, if you cite Watson, uh, do give a page number. Uh, you will want to look over that section in Watson to see how he puts his argument together, to see if you find it persuasive. I will give you a page number where I see something. So Watson says this in 99, I say that. You know, wh which is more persuasive? That's, that is what the questions, most, most of the questions will look like. Um, uh, another might be something like, you know, what was the significance of the Glorious Revolution? Watson says it's politics. I say it's economics, which is right. Uh, and again, you can be, you can say, you know, it's they're both right. Uh, maybe I would give them the, more of the nod to politics, or maybe more to to economics. Um, you don't need to cite me by date or anything like that. I, I, the there's the YouTube things that you can look at or look over if you want to uh, refer to something and quote, but there's no need to use a date to just say Professor Nelson said uh, in the lecture that. Uh, specific format, not really, except that it's, it's as well organized an answer as you can give. Let me give you, let me take one second and I'm going to turn off the screen so that I can do this safely. Okay, I'm going to turn this back on. So this is a question about, um, it's for a different class. Um, and the question was about what's called liberalism. And I talk uh, qu quite a bit about liberalism in the, uh, in the class and in the book. And liberalism is not the liberalism that you're thinking of. It's not like being liberal, being on the left. Liberalism in the 1870s referred to being um, believing in free trade. So those, the people who believed in free trade were called liberals. And people who believed in limited government were called liberals. And so the question is, was um, the, the problem with the Civil War uh, and Reconstruction caused by liberalism? And so what uh, you've got here, Uh, a kind of in, uh, an, an answer that starts out with, you know, what's uh, with the end of the war, that there's a central question to some, the disastrous e economic outcomes in the South lent credence to such, to one such answer, liberalism. The liberalism is a cause of the problems. During the final decades, this political philosophy would gain prominence and yield both destructive and constructive effects for American society. Okay? So the, so the argument here is that liberalism is both positive and negative, right? And that's and that's shown in that first paragraph, right? Very sure that you're saying this is this is my this is my thesis. Uh, liberalism is is the key issue, and it's both positive and negative. Um, uh, then goes on to explain what uh, liberalism is. Uses uh, the book to sort of talk about the problem, and then ties it up at the end with a concluding paragraph. Uh, and so the, mostly it was uh, the first, that central paragraph was about how destructive liberalism is. And then it's, um, and then here's the last part. The consequences of growth of liberal ideology were not entirely destructive. In the early 1880s, liberals helped bring about the end of the spoil system. Uh, liberals, both Democrats and Republicans, exerted a great deal of pressure to rid the spoil system. Um, and then the assassination of Garfield uh, led to general reform. Uh, and this is, a, this is a good answer in part because it looks kind of closely at the events and suggests uh, a solution. So it's a, what this is, is a very short paper. It's like a memo. And you'll be writing a lot of memos. Um, clarity, uh, you know, uh, 
precise discussion of particular events that proved your case one or the other. And I'm asking you about two cases, my, my argument or Watson's argument, and you want to choose one or a mix of the two or mostly Watson, a little bit of Nelson, mostly Nelson, a little bit of Watson. How you do it is yours, but you have to defend that by looking back over the lectures and the book. Does that make sense? All right, this should be fun. And uh, as I say, this will be your superpower, uh, I promise you. Uh, 10 years from now, when you're a CEO and you wonder, how did I get here? You'll say, it's the memo. Okay, thanks so much. Oh, answering a couple questions.